Hello Close Shavers, welcome to another episode on Close Shave TV. Today we have again some amazing guests. We're going to be discussing and exploring the issue of youth violence, particularly in our city of Birmingham. Uh, but before I introduce the guests, first I'd like to thank Billion Dollar Kebab for accommodating the show today. Uh, and I want to mention this quote. Okay, the sooner we can realize that pain is a trigger to the majority of our problems, the quicker we can help young people. Uh, Alison, I'd like to introduce you to the show. This is actually your quote that I got from uh, the um, Wolverhampton um, um, talk that you did. Mm. What, does, what did you mean by that exactly? Um, through my own experiences and the experiences of my son, yeah. then I started to see that if young people are hurt, that unless we support them, guide them, and love them through it, then they react, and that reaction, put it out on the street, can cause more pain, violence, and worst case scenario, death. So Indeed. I just think, you know, we need to look at a lot of the reasons why people are behaving the way they are. I lost my son Joshua in 2013 to knife crime, and from that, there was a lot of pain to young people through, you know, that listen to his music, friends, relatives, and I saw them being in a lot of pain, and I just wanted to help them and guide them through yeah. that pain, just like I did with my son, and it worked, you know, there was many people involved, they hadn't uh, did anything like retaliation, reaction, and I got them through it, and from that I now speak in schools, colleges, youth offending teams in the West Midlands and around the country. Okay. Uh, Craig, uh, on my right, uh, Craig Pinkney, you're a criminologist uh, and a lecturer at... Uh, University College Birmingham. University College Birmingham, I'm sorry. <laughs> what is the issue of youth crime right now today and the relevance? Because one of the things that you, you mentioned in your TED talk that I watched is the issue of invisibility, yeah? Amongst the youth. What do you mean by that exactly? I'll answer the second question before I answer the first one. I think what I was um, referring to about invisibility is that any group that's been made invisible always do things to show their visibility. We look at civil rights movement, we look at the, the, the plight of women within this country, we look at you know, the issues around Black Lives Matter. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere where you see that young people or individuals in society that have been pushed to the corner of society, they essentially do things to make themselves visible. So when we're talking about the concept of youth crime, you're talking about a society that doesn't really care much about young people. We're talking about a society that blames young people for society's problems. And young people are essentially saying that we are not the ones to solely blame. Yes, we are accountable for some of the things that we do. But really, if there's issues around poverty, if there's issues around injustice, there's issues around opportunity, there's issues around lack of opportunity, if there's issues around racial profiling, and you know, environments that they perceive to be violent, we need to do things in order for us to be seen and in order to be heard. If that means that I need to be the baddest person in my community, the baddest person that's on a social media platform, then I'll do that in order for you to see me, whether you like it or not, and that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. now, if you're talking about young people living in environments that they're petrified or living in environments where they're impacted by trauma, where they don't have the opportunity to essentially um, be supportive for that trauma and they display other behaviours and start hurting people. Why do we only blame the young people and don't blame the system mm. that's essentially creating that environment for those young people? Let me bring in uh, Ray Douglas, gangologist, uh, youth worker. Uh, again, you're, this is your lane, this is your speciality. What do you think about what Craig and Anderson have said so far? I think, um, I think what's interesting is to have the three of us in one space, which mm. is quite unique. And there's quite a few people across Birmingham who are doing great work. But what's also interesting is almost like the Rubik's Cube. We all see the cube from a different angle. We see different colours, we see different nuances. I think what we're at a place now, we're at a critical stage now, though, where the, violent, the, the, the youth are getting younger. So we're starting to see, myself, I'm sure the colleagues here, are starting to see primary schools now, excluding children coming in with knives, and not, not butter knives, carving knives. Oh my God. Um, Parents asking for help within school, primary schools. Head teachers talking to us about how we can respond to it. So, whether people will agree to it or not, violence is now becoming dominant youth culture, an extension of youth culture. 
And one of the reasons why I'm really happy that we've got us here today is because we can explore how each of us see in a different way. Mm. And why you yourself as a presenter, why have you addressed this? Because, yeah. because we saw what happened over the last three, three months across Birmingham and historically parts of Birmingham that you never saw that level of, 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 of violence. Yeah. Violence itself, you know, Craig, uh, we said youth violence and that could mean knife crime, gun crime. Um, in 2015, they said Birmingham became the gun capital of the UK. What can, we, what can we say in terms of diagnosis of the problem, in terms of the causes? What are the causes? Is it music? Is it drill music? Is it the culture? Is it too much PlayStation and, 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 and Call of Duty? What is, we hear so many things and it gets confusing sometimes. The problems, and when we talk about the, the core root, it's not one. I think what we do as a society is we need one answer. So now the discussion is it's drill music. Mm. Music is the reason. And I'm saying it's a factor. It's not the only factor. A lot of these issues are historical. Poverty has always been one of the key factors and why we see the things that we do. You know, I would talk about, you know, um, trauma and intergenerational trauma and how trauma has been passed down throughout generations and yeah. still hasn't been dealt with. You know, we talk about, you know, corporate responsibilities. You know, we're talking about industries that profit off violence. Indeed, you know, yeah. we're talking about movies, we're talking about gaming, you know, we're talking about music. And it's yeah. funny that you mentioned music but what, you, what we're doing is we're focusing on young people that make the music. What about the industries exactly. that profit from that? All of, all of these corporates now want a piece of the scene. Of course. When, when mm -hmm. Grime started out in its early days, it was just seen, just like breakdancing was seen as, oh, it'll go away, you know. Who are those guys like, spinning on their heads on the, the outline yeah. mm -hmm. now? Now, what do you see? Every other advert's got something hip hop connotation to it. Yeah, yeah. Likewise with Grime now, the corporates have seen, okay, we need a piece of that, so they'll get X artists to wear this, they'll fund this, they'll do that. You saw the, the horrific um, sports um, with Puma launching a campaign recently um, of a new product. They set up a trap house. Oh my God, okay. so, so you'd come, you'd get, a, you'd get a trap phone and a card and you go to this address and they're launching this new product and they've, they've decorated it and, and like a trap house you run mattresses with graffiti on the wall what else as adults have to stop this oh when I was a youth or, mm. or it wasn't like that in my day but it's relative deprivation as Craig yeah. mentioned because there was something else and mm -hmm. you said that you talk about music mm -hmm. so we're from that era where rave was the mu dominant music mm -hmm. now, I know a lot of my friends I went to school and college we've entered into the rave, rave space and synonymous with rave was class A drugs yeah yeah some of them got out of it, but some of them have never been the same since, the right? The ecstasy decade. Exactly. Yeah. This is the new ecstasy violence. Yeah. And, and again, we blame. Mm. We, we feed our young people through social media, the news, music, all these different areas. Yeah. The world's scary. Everyone's going to try mm. and hurt you. There's gangs everywhere, knife crime, gun crime, yeah. buses, parks. We're feeding that to them every single day and then wonder why they're reacting to the information we're giving them. Mm. But it's their fault. Mm. Mm. You know, mm. it's their fault they're frightened. And it's their fault that they see every single day knives, guns, knives, guns. And then, you know, put all that together and we wonder why they, you've got seven year olds going into school with a knife. They're playing games that you stab and kill people from the age of five. You know, we're, we're sitting in a country where. We're like the second largest weapons manufacturer in the world. You know, we, we export war, we export killing, we export violence. What day is it today? Today is Sunday. It's a Sunday. Yeah. What are we doing here on a Sunday afternoon? The sun's shining, and um, we're not funded to be here. You know, you're doing this out of passion. Yeah. We've been asked to come and have a conversation. The response to violence cannot be a nine to five yeah. um, occupation. Right, it's still pocketed in that space Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, maybe a bit of evening work. It's not going to work, right? Especially as Craig always mentions it, especially when the majority of the most at risk you're working with are only just waking up, yeah, just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. So, so, so if this was the private sector, the response would be a flawed model. Mm -hmm. What we're saying now is. I'm, I'm a firm believer that any response to this violence has to first and start be at the epicenter of the community, a community-led model. Mm -hmm. And when I mean community-led, informed by evidence, informed by best practice, informed by impact and everything, but community-driven. For me personally, why I'm here on this Sunday, I'm t I'm primarily I'm tired of seeing young black males dying and going to prison for life. Well, you Those two. And secondly, yeah, go on. 
But what I'm saying, and secondly, why? Because when I'm going into the prison, I walked. I was. I saw an exercise yard the other day. It was 95% of the guys in the exercise yard were black young men. 95, 97% of the people that came from Jamaica came with a trade in the Windrush years in that diaspora. 100% of them came with no criminal record because you weren't allowed to come here with a criminal record. Indeed. So then what's gone wrong and exactly. what's happened, right? Exactly. And, 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 and this isn't a colour thing because now we're starting to see the violence in the more kind of white yeah, working yeah. class areas, South Asia, Pakistani, mm -hmm. Arab, Yemeni, Somali. Yeah, exactly. Another thing that the media does, yeah, is they focus on, oh, he used to smoke marijuana, he used to... And the victim is just a victim. But Do you know can, what I mean? Can I just say one... And no, please, that please, is please, so come in, true. Come in. When a young person gets shot or stabbed, yep. as far as media and some of society are concerned, what have they done to deserve that? I get it. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I get that. it to do with Josh. Uh, or what was he doing? Was he yeah, in a yeah. gang? I'll be asked by radio presenters, was Josh in a gang? Why would my son be in a gang? Well... You know, you can see in their brain thinking, well, he was mixed race, mm -hmm. he did grime music, and he got stabbed with a knife, so of course he must have deserved it in some it's way. It's just part and part of the culture, right? And Absolutely. It, and, yeah, and, and it's, it's quite no disgusting. It, yeah, it is yeah, disgusting. Yeah. It's, it's Nobody disgusting. deserves to be murdered. It's as simple as that. Precisely. Okay. We've misunderstood youth culture to believe in that it only fits one particular group, and I think when we're talking about crime, it's important to understand that crime is racialized. Mm. You know, if I was to tell you to close your eyes right now and I was to give you a, um, a particular crime, you're already got in your head, based on the narratives of the media and others, what that particular individual essentially would look like. If I say, you know, what does a terrorist look like in yeah. 2018, I already know what the image is in your head. So mm. what the media essentially do is that they shape the narrative and they reshape our understanding and narratives of what people look like when we're talking about violence. So we talk about youth crime and we talk about knives and we talk about guns. And the narrative is to get us to shape the individuals that are using it. So yeah. we have to start to have deeper conversations about mm. well, where are these young people getting the guns from? Who is it coming from? So Precisely. me being part of a lot of strategic boards and sitting in a lot of advisory groups, I get to understand yeah. and learn when we're talking about gun crime in the yeah. community. It's not on the level that we're talking now. Yeah. It's on a different level. It's coming from predominantly upper class, white working class groups of individuals that live in very nice houses outside mm. of the city. They've no, set never... up an industry <laughs> yeah. where they're creating bullets, they're fitting old World War II weapons, yes. and they're being sold into the same community. So they've been amended so, in a way. It sounds like the same concept of the corporates then. Because the corporates, if the, the, content of, if the content of the music is around violence, the content of the game around violence, and they sign it off, the content of the they, film they is they around violence. Off, yeah. And there's no counter narrative. It's just promoting it in order for the sales. It's the same. What is it's similar, gentrification I mean, of what, what is similar to uh, Stormzy, right? I mean, he he come, he's a very educated young lad, right? What straight A's almost in his GCSEs and whatnot. But then again, his new commercial album, he speaks about you know throwing someone in a boot and doing this and that and the other. And again, the idea of violence and uh, the, the idea of showing off. And I think it's part of just naturally being a youth and being a youngster. No, but I I, but, I, I, I challenge that because when they're talking, they're talking from the perspective of either the here and now or where they've once been. Guaranteed right now, 2018, most of the most prominent individuals that are making that type of music, guaranteed that they're engaging in that type of behavior. For me, that's quite scary. Mm -hmm. And that's not young people's fault, that's the society's fault because mm -hmm. we as adults are looking at it from our 1988 yeah. perspective and saying, yeah. well, when we were growing up, young people weren't like that and you young people are not as bad. And that's why I don't use the terminology, you know, wannabe bad boy no more because right. when you say wannabe, that young person in their circumference might be actually that real deal. Mm. But again, what is it in them that feels they need to compensate for whatever is lacking? In not all cases, because everything is, you know, there's so many different reasons. But there's reasons. a void, right? I, I think so. I think on, in some cases there's a void, and so they need to fill that void, and that is to make themselves be seen to be the hardest, the there's most violent, the, the one with the most chains. But what Craig just said as well, the way the press put things out, what that also does, which is some of the work that I think needs to be done, is it makes parents think, it will never be my child, mm. because my child isn't, doesn't look like that, and my child doesn't live in this area. You've got these artists who are kind of like, you know, inner city, young men, spitting whatever. Yeah. But when you look out into the festival, it's not, it doesn't look like the communities where they're of from. Course. Mm. But all those people in the crowd know the songs word for word. Of course. Yeah. But, interest, but, they, but they've got work on Monday. And some of them have got two holidays a year mm. and two cars on the drive mm. and they live in gravel drive communities, yeah. right? It's entertainment. Mm. 
But when you're that young person on the seventh floor, that block of flats, and the lift never works, and when it does work, it's full of urine, and man are shutting outside that flat, and you haven't seen dad in a minute, and there's bookies and betting shops and bad food and all these things outside, that's the difference. So to them, it's entertainment. But all the prisons we've worked in, I've never heard Adele coming out of a cell. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's, it's a creative outlet, outlet as well, like your son, you know, Joshua, he, he found some form of creativity at the same mm-hmm. time. An you know, expression. Dexman and expression. And it, I'm guessing that was he his really counseling. needed counselling. He needed, it was like, it was, like he, it was his calling, right? And he needed yeah, that. He did. he did. But again, the conversation. Um, when he was 12 and his lyrics were drive-by shootings and he'd come in and I'd just look at him and go, you've been doing a drive-by shooting today, Josh? And he'd laugh. I says, you're putting yourself out there and have that conversation. And I'd be scared people are going to think this, they're going to think that. And it took a long time. Unless you secure their mentality through, you know, make them feel secure inside and loved and supported, it's going to be very difficult to get them on a positive journey. So for Josh, the education for him was those things, not school. Yeah, right, right. you say to a lot of parents, you know, pro- your priority isn't going to be their yeah. exams. They're yeah. like horrified. What do you mean? You know, so a lot of pressure, a lot of, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. For Josh, some of his lyrics were very negative, but, you know, yeah. I just saw it as an expression. It's an expression. And how many, how many, how many do youth actually act out on what they're doing? Is it hype? Is it just testosterone? Is it adolescence? My you know son I mean? had a lot of pain inside him and he didn't know what to do with it. And sometimes it came out with anger, aggression, being arrested, all these different things. But I saw that as a reaction, not him. And so I saw his heart was hurt. And how can I rebuild that security inside of him? So the, the thing for me though is then, like back again, and I hate to bring up football, but people who are not into football, and I understand how someone could take their money, fly halfway across the, across the world, not even to watch the match, but to kick off and to have an interaction with another set of hooligans. Football hooligans. People can't understand that. And in those crowds, I'm not like solely kind of like guys who are at risk of society. You've got people in there who are professionals. And testosterone. So, man. not just testosterone, disease, violence is a disease. Mm. What we need to transfer to young people now is that you might be, be affected by this disease called violence. And people can't understand that concept. What I'm saying, it's caught, it's like a forest fire now. Mm. Mm. It's like a forest mm. fire. Because I got up, like, people here, we got up and down the country, and you think, but I just heard that back in that city, and it's the same thing. And then I'm in this other, si- in this other school, I'm in this other prison, and it's the same thing, it's caught, it's a forest fire. Violence has caught a fire. We can't no longer think that we can just put it out with a little hose. We have to have a systemic change. It's epidemic. It's epidemic. epidemic. So if you look at if you look at the, the, the narrative around, for example, um, terrorism. Mm. So public sector spaces and organisations have a statutory responsibility to respond yeah. to anything related to you know to prevent and so yeah. on. To, right, rightly so. Right. But more young people die of knife crime and gun crime terrorism. than die of terrorism. terrorism. Yeah. Yeah. But there's not a statutory requirement mm. to respond. So my my thing is this: we have to start working on this as a project, it's a movement. Mm. The young people have learned violence, we have to now teach peace mm. in all spaces. Precisely. Yeah? Whether it be faith spaces, schools, youth centers, you know, within some, teach peace because they've learned violence. I mean, uh, I'm gonna bring in some statistics and if you can help me out with this, Craig, uh, some, some statistics that I read about uh, in 2017, about 37,500 reported knife related crime up by about 22% from the previous year of 2016. Um, it was similar to about 33,000 in 2011, then there was like a dip in between, and now it's gone up again. What are these statistics pointing us to exactly? Um, wh- why is there a surge, and then there's a drop, and then it goes up again? What is it? Is it just a human behavior? I think, I think Ray just made it very clear. You know, use the analogy of the forest fire. The fire is spreading. And I think you'll have moments where um, criminal justice measures may seem to work, where they may embark sanctions, they may incarcerate groups of individuals, and it might seem like things are going quiet for a moment, and then you have what's called a power vacuum, mm-hmm. and then you'll have sporadic types of violence because people are uh, running for power, 
and also we have to again start to ask new questions about in terms of where the firearms come from and then what circuits are they coming from and what yeah. part of the country are they getting Cause into? Because it's not like knife crime, like you mentioned yourself, look, anyone can grab a knife, it's in your kitchen uh, drawer, but gun crime is a bit different, it's a slightly but different element, there right? would be a lot more gun crime if the bullets were cheap. Yeah. If it were cheap, well, if it was legal, if it was legal, no, legal. No, the, the reality is, is that yeah. everyone's a knife, a drawer away from a knife. A person knows, you know, you had, a, you had someone who's a recognised artist within an industry, it changed. It made it. I, I saw all the. I saw the artists comment on, on it. You know, I, I read those tweets. And yeah. every every few years, you get a tipping point. Now, what's going to be the next tipping point? What is going to be the next? We had a tip this week. A 16-year-old charged with the murder of a six-year-old girl. This week in England. So we're getting now. We're seeing more and more young violence. The youngest murderer I've worked with is 13. The youngest rapist I've ever worked with in, in the children's security unit is 12. My Lord. And this is the, the, so we're not trying to create a moral panic. What I'm saying is, it's, you know, you see this hashtag, enough is enough. It's not that the hashtag should be enough now. Now it's time we either acknowledge this, yeah. or we're going to have to start addressing people and individuals and systems because those, those children being buried is on all of our watch. But you know, you bring it back to uh, this uh, kind of, it's an ailment, it's a disease, disease brother. it's a behavioral issue. I can't help but bring it back to some form of spirituality. Do you know what I mean? Is, 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 are we lacking a connection with a higher purpose? Do you know what I mean? That we need to behave in such a way. Is it anything to do with that? Is it like what 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 is it that we're missing exactly? That's what I'm trying to hard, finding hard to kind of well, grasp. If you go back to the premise of what Ray's saying about violence is a disease. If you're infected with a disease, then it blocks out all of the things in which the natural immune system is essentially going to enable you to be healthy again. So whereas I would say that a lot of the religious institutions are wrong in terms of their um, engagement with young people, they're just assuming that just giving them the words of a spiritual book yeah. is, going to, is going to heal the problem. And I'm not saying that there's not healing in terms of the process. What I'm saying is we need to engage with the disease. Alison mentioned earlier, if we're talking about trauma, let's start dealing with trauma. And then once we start dealing with the trauma, then the door opens, then to use whatever spirituality yeah. so or it's, whatever it's a, it's it is. a mental health issue. Well, well it's like, we, again, we don't do it in a way. How many campaigns do we see? How many police officers will stand in front of a, a whole year of school kids, throw statistics at them? If you carry a knife, you could go to prison for four years. But that part of their brain is blocked, so you have to initially, in my opinion, open and start to ease that open before you can even start to change, support, and, and help them in a better direction. So it's about nurturing them. Yeah, absolutely, and not being disrespectful to young people. Patronising What them, yeah. right have we got to go in and stand in front of a child and say, if you do this, you're, this is going to happen? They're looking at you as if to say, who are you to talk to me? Because Not because they're disrespectful and rude, but perhaps they have never been taught respect, never been nurtured, never been loved. So this is like, whoa, it makes no sense to them. Um, is it just simply a racial thing? It, 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 it goes way beyond these type of um, identity politics. Desensitisation. So one thing we're not saying is there are, there are a number of these young people who don't fear death. Because they they're so, they've seen so many people die around them, mm. or affiliation, that they, they, they believe that it's part, part of the process if you get caught slipping, as they call it. Or if you get, and, and this is a sad thing, so you become desensitised to the violence, or the concept, the notion of mortality, right? Because if, you have, if you've had two, three, four, five of your people around you murdered, another five, ten or seven long time sentences in prison, these things affect you. You know, these things affect you, and, and people talk about trauma, but living through trauma, mm. you know, yeah. that's, why, that's why a lot of time living through, that's why the living through the trauma comes from the alcohol, through the drugs, mm. Mm. Through, uh, you know, through the, because that, that numbs the pain. So the not, not, not just an individual level, but societal, if you like, as a community, we're kind of going through PTSD mm. without even realising well, it. I call it post-traumatic streets. Post 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 post-traumatic yeah. streets disorder. Not, not stress yeah, disorder. I like that. Because you're changing, you've got no fix the board. You're changing your phone every two weeks. You've got, you don't know if it's going to be, who's going to kick off your door, whether it's going to be the enforcement, whether it's going to be them man there, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's not healthy. Yeah. That's not healthy on a day-to-day -day basis. We ran a program recently and one of the young men said, he believes he caught, Craig was there, he believes he caught diabetes because of the stress related to the yeah. role. 
Mm. And he saw his brethren having a stroke in the car because he had a court case. He said he saw it having in front of him. These are the conversations people have ever had. You know, and back to thinking about spirituality, I mean, I'm not really, I don't really sugarcoat it mm. when it comes to faith groups. I, I really think all faith groups need to have a real honest look at themselves. Because if the only time you turn up is to bury the young people, then I don't understand what that scripture that you're reading. Because you've got these buildings that have got massive space, big spaces, loads of tithes and zakat and sadaqa and all these things. Yeah, charity and more. Charity, yeah, and yeah. your food banks. We don't need just food. We need, we need mind banks and heart banks, not just food banks. And, you that's, know, deep, that's deep, that's deep. That's so we, need, we don't need food banks, we need mind banks and heart banks. Everywhere. Everywhere. So not just, you know, in any, anywhere there's a young person. You know. So, like the police officer in the, in, in, the, in the same school you'd visit would be like, if you commit a knife crime, carry a knife, you get four years or whatnot. But what's your approach? What do I you say, for example? I talk about the life lost. I talk about Joshua and I talk with 100% honesty about his struggles. And I say that in the hope that they think, mm. oh, hang on a second. He went through all that and yet still managed to pull it back. I share the love we had. Mm. But I also focus on the fact that. You might not have that love, you might not have the support, but you have the one thing, Josh does not have a life. Now, mm. we need to be helping you live that life. I guess the challenge is, is you convincing just the average Joe public that you also have a vested interest in this. Do you know what I mean? If they have children, families, parents, and people attached to their life, then this is also their problem. Because when it comes on to their doorstep and don't think it can't, it can and then they will realise how important it is. That's deep. Okay, I want to wrap it up very quickly in terms of each, uh, each of you can just tell me what you think in a few points are the solutions. I think we've said, we've said the solution uh, and I think I don't want to do the traditional this is the solution because mm -hmm. it's an array of solutions because it's an epidemic. You know, if you're talking about violence being a disease, if that's what our mantra is today, then engaging with the disease is not going to be one particular solution. We're going to need a what is called a public health approach, and a public health approach in order to respond to that violence that is community-led, based on desistance and how that's going to desist young people around violence. But when we talk about public health approach, it's not about essentially looking at individuals as them being somewhat the victim. It's looking at a societal re response. So that means it needs to also incorporate societal perceptions and societal change. Perfect example, Ray just said just a moment ago, we open the page and look at, you know, the page of the young boy um, that's been um, stabbed or shot, or we look at another page and we see loads of faces of young people that have committed a particular crime and then we flip back over. The change in the mindset would mean that you stay on that page, that the football ain't important, or as important as those first two pages. So until we get to that, then society won't change. Violence will always exist, as long as there's poverty, crime, as long as all of those issues that we've mentioned throughout this um, discussion today, as long as they exist, violence, crime, gangs will also um, be here. But what we can do is reduce that in a new model where places in the world have adapted those models and we've seen slight changes. And if we were to incorporate that okay. on this particular level, we'll be able to do so. Alice, I'm going to leave you till last, yeah? Okay. I want to bring you in next, please. Right? In short, just teach peace. Just teach peace. To learn what it looks like share with the young people, cascade it, show them what it looks like, what it feels like. And if they don't know what it feels like because they've never experienced it, try and take them on that journey. Because we're trying to get young people to adulthood with less scars, emotionally, spiritually, physically as possible. That's all it's about. And then they hand over. But really, it's, we need to relearn what does peace look like ourselves and then cascade that back within society because um, some of the, if you go back over the video, you see some of the statistics we've been speaking about the ages are getting younger, the crimes are getting more violent, and society's a bit like, oh, okay. And if you, we're, we're two, three weeks away from the summer holidays, all of us, we're of that generation where there was a six weeks of activities, whether your parents could afford it or not, there was an opportunity for you to go into a space, a safe space, and do something over six weeks, build the friendships. Yeah. You might have had a little fight here and there, headlock here and there. Yeah. You go on a seaside trip, you do these little things. The leisure build. centre, have what where, the are they now? They have, where are the leisure centres? Where, where, where are the six week programmes right now? And the police cuts and all the rest of it. Yeah. But, but police, the answer to this isn't with the police. Yes, Any police officer, predominantly retired one, will tell you that. Hmm. The answer's not with them, the answer's with us. 
as in a community-led assistance model. Okay, great. Each piece. Alison, you got the mic. <laughs> um, I, I think we need to do everything we can to help heal, support the pain ripping through communities. Um, that's going to be difficult, but it's possible. And then we could save lives, but also to do everything we can to prevent the next generation being brought up, being hurt, damaged, but also to support the families, the schools, the communities. Anywhere there's a young person should be supported to help and guide that young person to have a future because every life that's lost is a future lost and that isn't okay. That's what we need to be doing everything we can to prevent. Every life that's lost is a future that is lost. Okay, so in a nutshell, change the approach, Craig, not to be a punitive kind of, you know, uh, criminal justice type of outlook, but to work with the people and be more holistic, teach peace and heal the pain. Okay, I uh, appreciate I really thank all of you for attending. Uh, thanks a lot. God bless, and uh, we will definitely stay in touch. Uh, shape boundary. We're definitely going to stay in touch. Either want to do more work together, uh, definitely. And I hope this discussion can bring some form of sanity to the madness out there, and heal the hearts that are diseased and the minds that may need help as well. Take care. God bless. Stay tuned to Close Shave TV.